I find it a little difficult to say what the subject matter of this seminar is going to be, because it's too fundamental to give it a title. I'm going to talk about what there is. Now, the first thing, though, uh, that we have to do is to get our perspectives with some background about the basic ideas which influence our everyday common sense, our fundamental notions about what life is about. Ideas of the world which are built into the very nature of the language we use and of our ideas of logic and of what makes sense altogether. And these basic ideas I call myth, not using the word myth to mean simply something untrue, but to use the word myth in a more powerful sense. A myth is an image in terms of which we try to make sense of the world. You, as a human being, you grow out of this physical universe in just exactly the same way that an apple grows off an apple tree. So let's say the tree which grows apples is a tree which apples, using apple as a verb. And a world in which human beings arrive is a world that peoples. And so the existence of people is symptomatic of the kind of universe we live in. Just as hair on a head is symptomatic of what's going on in the organism. But we have been brought up not to feel that we belong in the world. So our popular speech reflects it. We say, I came into this world. You didn't, you came out of it. We say, face facts. We talk about encounters with reality. As if it was a head-on meeting of completely alien agencies. And the average person has the sensation that he is a somewhat that exists inside a bag of skin, the center of consciousness, which looks out at this thing and what the hell is it going to do to me? Uh, I recognize you. You kind of look like me and uh, I've seen myself in a mirror and uh, you, you look like you might be people. <laughs> so maybe you're intelligent. Maybe you can love too. And uh, maybe perhaps you're all right. Some of you are anyway got the right color of skin or you have the right religion or whatever it is you're okay but there are all those people over in Asia and Africa and they may not really be people when you want to destroy someone you always define them as unpeople We have this hostility to the external world because of the superstition, the myth, the absolutely unfounded theory that you yourself exist only inside your skin. Now, I want to propose another idea altogether. Billions of years ago, you were a big bang. Now, you're a complicated human being. But so we define ourselves as being only that. 
If you think that you are only inside your skin, you define yourself as one very complicated little curly cube, way out on the edge of that explosion, way out in space and way out in time. And we, then we cut ourselves off and don't feel that we are still the Big Bang. But you are. Depends how you define yourself. You are actually, if, if this is the way things started, if there was a Big Bang in the beginning, you're not something that is a result of the Big Bang. You're not something that is a sort of puppet on the end of the process. You are still the process. You are the Big Bang the original force of the universe coming on as whoever you are. See, when I meet you, I see not just what you define yourself as, Mr. So-and-so, Miss So-and-so, Mrs. So-and-so. I see every one of you as the primordial energy of the universe coming on at me in this particular way. I know I'm that too. But we've learned to define ourselves as separate from it. What I would call a kind of a basic problem we've got to go through first is to understand that there are no such things as things. That is to say, separate things. That that is only a way of talking. If you can understand this, you're going to have no further problems. I once asked a group of high school children, what do you mean by a thing? And first of all, they gave me all sorts of synonyms. They said, it's an object, which is simply another word for a thing. It doesn't tell you anything about what you mean by a thing. Finally, a very smart girl who was in the group said, a thing is a noun. And she was quite right. A noun isn't a part of nature, it's a part of speech. There are no nouns in the physical world. There are no separate things in the physical world either. See, the physical world is wiggling. Clouds, mountains, trees, people are all wiggling. And uh, only when human beings get working at things, they build buildings in straight lines and try and make out that the world isn't really wiggling. But here are we sitting in this room all built on straight lines, but each one of us is as wiggly as all get out. Now then, when you uh, want to get control of something that wiggles, it's pretty difficult, isn't it? You try and pick up a fish in your hands and the fish is wiggly and it slips out. What do you do to get hold of the fish? You use a net. And so the, the net is the basic thing we have for getting hold of the wiggly world. A net is something regular. And I can number the holes in a net. So many so holes up, so many holes across. And if I can number these holes, I can count exactly where each wiggle is in terms of a hole in that net. But in order to do that, I've got to break up the wiggle into bits. And I've got to call this a specific bit, and this the next bit of the wiggle, and this the next bit, and this the next bit of the wiggle. And so these bits, are things which I mark out in order to talk about the wiggle, in order to measure it, and therefore in order to control it. But in nature, in fact, in the physical world, the wiggle isn't bitted. So the world doesn't come thing. You and I are all as much continuous with the physical universe as a wave is continuous with the ocean. The ocean waves and the universe people and as the wave, I wave at you and say, you, the world is waving at me with you and saying, uh, hi, I'm here. 
but the way we feel and sense our existence being based on a myth that we are made that we are parts that we are things our consciousness has been influenced so that each one of us does not feel that we feel we have been hypnotized literally hypnotized by social convention into feeling and sensing that we exist only inside our skins that we are not the original bang but just something out on the end of it and therefore we are scared stiff because my wave is going to disappear and i'm going to die and that would be awful a fluke. You are a separate event. And you run from the maternity ward to the crematorium and that's it, baby. Now, why does anybody think that way? There's no reason to because it isn't even scientific. It's just a myth. And it's invented by people who wanted to feel a certain way. They want to play a certain game. Camus said there is only really one serious philosophical question, which is whether or not to commit suicide. Should you or not commit suicide? This is a good question. Why go on? And you only go on if the game is worth the candle. Now, the universe has been going on for an incredible long time. And so, really, uh, a, a satisfactory theory of the universe has to be one that's worth betting on. That's a very, it seems to me, absolutely elementary common sense. If you make a theory of the universe which isn't worth betting on, why bother? Just commit suicide. But if you want to go on playing the game, you've got to have an optimal theory for playing the game. If there is any such thing at all as intelligence and love and beauty, well, you found it in other people. In other words, it exists in us as human beings. And as I said, if it is there in us, it is symptomatic of the scheme of things. We are as symptomatic of the scheme of things as the apples are symptomatic of the apple tree or the rose of the rose bush. The earth is not a big rock infested with living organisms any more 
then your skeleton is bones infested with cells. The earth is geological, yes, but this geological entity grows people. And our existence on the earth is a symptom of the solar system and its balances, as much as the solar system in turn is a symptom of our galaxy. And our galaxy in its turn is a symptom of the whole company of galaxies. Goodness only knows what that's in. When, as a scientist, you describe the behavior of a living organism, you try to say what a person does. It's the only way in which you can describe what a person is. Describe what they do. Then you find out that in making this description, you cannot confine yourself to what happens inside the skin. In other words, you can't talk about a person walking unless you start describing the floor. Because when I walk, I don't just dangle my legs in empty space. I move in relationship to a room. And so in order to describe what I'm doing when I'm walking, I have to describe the room. I have to describe the territory. So in, in, in de describing my talking at the moment, I can't describe this just as a thing in itself because I'm talking to you. And so what I'm doing at the moment is not completely described unless your being here is described also. So if that is necessary, if in other words, in order to describe my behavior, I have to describe your behavior and the behavior of the environment, it means that we've really got one system of behavior. That what I am involves what you are. I don't know who I am unless I know who you are. And you don't know who you are unless you know who I am. In other words, we are not separate. We define each other. We're all backs and fronts to each other. We and our environment and all of us and each other are interdependent systems. We know who we are in terms of other people. We all lock together. And this is again and again the serious scientific description of how things happen and any good scientist knows that what you call the external world is as much you as your own body <laughs>